Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Red Kailainen. I'm the CEO and founder of Ultimate AI. And I'm here to talk about why chatbots are hard, why you should do them and should not do them. Basically, it's just a smart, small introduction about me. Uh, I'm a TUT alumni almost, just one thesis away from it. Um, founded the company in 2014, and we're now a team of nine. Uh, basically, what we do is we teach machines to understand human language. So you would, could say that we build the, the brains of those chatbots. So when you talk to a chatbot, uh, it should understand what you are saying. And uh, just to clarify what, what I consider as a chatbot, I know there's a lot of Facebook bots currently because they have a thing that don't use natural language, so they're just buttons and pictures. Uh, I personally, because I come from customer service world, I consider those more like apps, and I consider chatbots as something you have a conversation with. So just to clarify. Okay, that's might be slow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm really... Uh, Hesitant on those. Yeah, so a uh, team of nine currently uh, engineering heavy, so to speak. Uh, three founders, uh, two in the sales and the marketing, and then the rest are basically building the uh, deep learning algorithms and also uh, building the interfaces for those algorithms. And this talk won't be a lot about how we use APIs, but I'm more than happy to have a conversation afterwards. Uh, this is more on how, what are those chatbots and why, what are the biggest challenges of those because I think they can be interfaces of APIs, so to speak. So you have a conversation with an API when you have a conversation with a chatbot. So if you don't know the challenges of chatbots, you might build something nobody wants to use. So I'd like to focus on that. Uh, yeah, so based in Tampere, now also in Helsinki, and did a little detour in Dubai. So we're trying to manage with the growth, business is going well, and there's a big demand on these uh, uh, AI bots, and we try to keep up with the, with the demand and the hype. And we have learned the challenges of those chatbots. So I think chatbots have been around like from the 60s, and I've seen a lot of videos from uh, these uh, talks about chatbots, so I don't, I don't want to go too deep on those, but basically, uh, a year ago, Facebook launched the chatbot platform. Everybody started building chatbots, and then everybody realized that uh, they don't really work. Uh, they are like, I think the hype was so strong that people thought that these are these alien sentient beings that came to our world, and now we can have a talk with them, and they're smarter than people. And then they, people started trying them, and they can't even understand when I say, hi, what's up? And then they feel really disappointed. And now there's kind of a second wave coming that people started to focus on those algorithms and how to make them actually understand us. And uh, people are projecting the next wave of chatbots, but we'll see where it goes. Uh, just a technical background, why now? Why not 10 years ago? Uh, well, everybody's, everybody have heard of AI and deep learning and machine learning and all those uh, nice words. Uh, some of them actually work. So, for example, speak rec speech recognition uh, five years ago or something like that was the accuracy was seventy percent. So almost every third word was missed totally. So you can't really use uh, Alexa in two thousand and ten because it won't understand what you are speaking. Uh, last year, the accuracy went over ninety five percent thanks to deep learning. Uh, that means that it's basically uh, uh, better than a human, at, at least in these test scenarios. But that, what this makes is that you can actually have these Alexa or so Google Home at your home, and you can build these uh, applications to them, and only because the algorithms are good enough that they can understand your speed. So that's why I just want to emphasize that uh, it's really important to build these really kind of low-level algorithms before we start of hyping stuff up, up. I know you've seen, or if you check the videos from previous, 
uh, talks you've seen this picture. Uh, uh, usually people say why chat? Well, because of this uh, top four messaging apps are bigger than top four social networking apps. Uh, this just means that people like to use WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and so on. And everybody's kind of them uh, starts to think that maybe we, as a brand, we should go to the, to the close channels where the customers are already. We should go to WhatsApp, we should go to Facebook Messenger and have a conversation. And because the social social huge, Facebook has billions of users, you can't have a billions of conversations uh, simultaneously, which then you have those bots to deploy on. Uh, so this is actually a quite good diagram on different kinds of bots. So the easiest ones are these rules-based bots. If then, then that, basically. So uh, I ask a question, and then say, when somebody asks this question, answer with this exact answer. Uh, and then when I have a closed domain, so I'm not trying to build a Siri, uh, I'm maybe building on, um, let's say, an FAQ board or whatever, a recipe board or so on. So it's much easier to know what, what you can actually ask. Uh, and those are the most, most easiest ones to build. Uh, you can't really build a rules-based bot on open domain. So building a series with all different variations of questions is kind of impossible. Then you have these generative bots, which are really interesting and really hard meaning that they are not rules-based. And usually, even the answers are generated by the AI. Uh, when the domain is closed, you can kind of anticipate what people are asking, or maybe you have a good data set for that. But still, it's really hard to make those work, because machines can't really, it's really hard for machines to understand the semantic meaning of things. They can produce. Uh, kind of a correct language, but it might not make any sense to us humans. So it's kind of doable, but it's really hard. And then if you build a generative bot that works, works on open domain, so you can talk about everything, you basically build a general AI. And that's, uh, uh, that's good for you, but that, I think that won't happen for a while. So these are kind of the four categories, and everybody is currently in the rules space. Uh, category and some are maybe some research that's been done in the generative uh, closed domain bots. Kind of the background of the technology, we started with these hard coded rules in the 60s and 90s, and still many use hard coded rules or regex or something like that. Uh, the problem is that when I ask how are you or how are you without the question mark or how are you, you have to map all of those. And it's quite easy to see that it's really hard to do uh, and build those bots, or it will take. I know there are some bots like um, that people have worked on like 20 years, and they start to become quite OK. But still, I wouldn't want to spend 20 years building this. Uh, I think in the, after the 90s, they came these statistical methods, usually meaning a bag of words. So. Let's do some basic statistics on the sentences and try to figure out what's the meaning. And what they basically do is they look at the words that are in the sentence. Uh, usually, they remove all the kind of the most uh, common words. So there's these stop words which you remove, like uh, I. Which are usually the keywords, and then you use those to. For example, do a, a search. Uh, many are using this. Uh, uh, what's the? I forgot the name of the search uh, engine. Something like. But yeah, there's a lot of search engines open source, which are work quite nicely. But they are still using just the keywords. And with the keywords, you lose a lot of meaning of the sentence. So yeah, maybe if you can strip away, like I forgot my password, and then there's forgot password you might find the correct answer. But then if you have, uh, this is kind of a typical example, if you have a medical report saying that patients' white cells are destroying cancer cells or cancer cells are destroying white cells, I don't know if this is medically correct, uh, but the sentences are really similar, but the word order is different. Uh, and these back of words statistical methods would consider these exactly the same thing. And it might be kind of catastrophic 
if the machine would say that this is this patient is having a, a great time it's, it's working really well even if it's not so I think now people are focusing a lot with deep learning even though there's a lot of debate in the natural language processing world but if you have a lot of data you can in theory kind of find these really small nuances in these sentences and for example in uh, let's say I want to uh, get the sentiment of this sentence uh, I'm not the back of words models would see that I have an exciting uh, brilliant great they would actually consider this to be really positive but because I have the neg negation in the end this is actually a neg negative review uh, and deep learning models could actually pick these really small nuances of those sentences and say that this is a negative review or that this is somebody who's uh, yeah, so basically a negative review and that's why uh, these are really po powerful and what we believe that is kind of the future of this conversational interfaces. Just a quick quick uh, dip to deep learning. So uh, basically people think that there are these magic boxes that you have this, uh, this architecture where you have these neurons and then layers of those neurons and when you have designed the architecture really well, you just feed in a lot of data. This is a picture example because it's easier to kind of wrap around your head. So you can feed a lot of pictures to this network and then uh, see what the result is. Let's say there's four different classes. Is it the banana or an apple or a monkey? Uh, and then when the network makes a guess, you correct it if it's wrong or right and then use the error to kind of calculate the weights of kind of the neurons again and you do this a few million times and you actually have created a network that you can fit in a completely new picture and it will tell what it is because each of the layers have picked up different features or kind of they focus on different things so in here the first layer is kind of uh, focusing on edges the second of like combination of edges the last is focusing on these faces and then you have the Four different classes coming out and these are really good because you don't really bro you program them yes but you don't really kind of actively develop and add more stuff it's just like how you design the architecture and then it's mainly about the data you feed in and with pictures you've seen with self-driving and cars this works really well and also with language you have a lot of data and if you can actually for a lot of annotated language data, these models they actually provide state-of-the-art results. Uh, another thing is that people like to use is uh, these, these use word vectors or kind of this vector representation of words or sentences. This is actually a picture from Google, but uh, this is just a nice visualization. So uh, semantically similar things grouped together kind of inside the brains of the network uh, you know in a way that you can you can have with words you can have a king and a ruler quite close to each other so then when somebody is talking about the ruler you know that it's uh, he's talking about the king uh, and then these are from Google's uh, neural translator Sim uh, similar sentences are kind of close to each other though so there's three different sentences in this small cluster and they all mean the same thing and they actually are all with different languages so you can actually kind of make this better by adding new languages and that's something Google has made uh, uh, quite successful so they trained the neural translator and now they deploy it to all languages uh, including Finnish they had some problems in the beginning with uh, the names of the Finnish people uh, but now they have fixed it uh, so these are really uh, important when you use these deep learning networks uh, just a quick kind of uh, many of you might see similar things on how these chatbots then work when they use deep learning for example or other methods is that we use this thing called slot filling uh, I don't know if you familiar with other kind of APIs like API.ai or with AI and so on, they also use this similar concept. So you don't, leave, for example, when we train our network, we don't train like from question to answer. So we ask a question and the network outputs an answer. We actually use kind of this uh, thing called intent. So it's kind of a variable basically. 
uh, that tries to represent what's the meaning of the sentence. So here I say I need a book of flight. So intention is a variable or, uh, called flight query. So it kind of it's like a name of a function, for example. Then you have these slots, or somebody can use the word entities or there are other things, but in research they use slots. So you have these slots which are kind of the key words. So in here, uh, a slot is New York and Helsinki. And how the slot filling works is quite nice because you can say that, hey, if somebody wants to book a flight, we need to do a flight query. And then we need uh, variables uh, from, to, and then time. And you can imagine how these fit into, for example, API calls. So let's say I say I need a book of flight. Net the network gives me that, uh, OK, there's a flight query, but there's three variables missing. We need to ask them. And then you start to fill those slots. You ask, where are you going to New York? And you fill that slot uh, to New York. Uh, where are you departing uh, from Helsinki? When are you like, willing to fly tomorrow? And you, you don't have to kind of, you don't, you don't even have to build this order. You just have to say what needs to be filled to be able to query the API. And the network or the chatbot does the uh, asking of the kind of the uh, important values. And this is something I would imagine that uh, would be really beneficial when having a conversations with uh, APIs or if you have a Slack bot. Uh, this is how they should work. I know many of them don't work yet, but this is kind of a new thing. Then, why are the chatbots so hard? So actually what I'm here to talk about, there's a lot of things why they are hard. Uh, I'm actually, I realized later that I just gave a lot of reasons why they are hard. I'm, no explanations for how to overcome those things, but we're going to have the conversations later. Yeah, over pizza. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I counted on that. Uh, so basically, uh, one thing what is hard, this is what I picked on Reddit. It's kind of a little not suitable for work, but uh, it's really hard to predict what people are asking. So when you have a bot and you have to design the answers, you have to kind of write the answers, the people might ask whatever, even though you say this is a uh, pizza ordering bots, people start asking what's the weather and so on. It's really hard to predict what people are asking. And when they can't have the answers, they're not uh, getting they are disappointed. Uh, and one, what we are doing when we do this enterprise customer service automation, we take their all of their chat historical logs and kind of analyze those and kind of try to find what people are actually asking. Because when you know what people are asking, you can uh, kind of do really well, even though you wouldn't be using the latest state-of-the-art methods. With regex, you might, might be build a good bot when you just know what people are going to ask. But people are really unpredictable. Then the kind of the AI part is that uh, how they are asking it. It's kind of, we've seen, I've seen a lot of different kind of chat logs and conversation and, and real data, how people are having the conversations in chats. And it's kind of, I, I, it's really hard for humans to understand, the other humans, what, what, what is this person asking? Because it's so many, you can ask the same thing so many ways. So that's, I think, one of the biggest things, or two of the biggest things why the Facebook bot launch kind of dipped, because people were asking, having conversations, and the machines didn't have the answers, and then they couldn't understand the answers, even they had them. And then kind of the biggest thing in everything, like everybody asks how to build a good chatbot, is usually like, does a chatbot bring value? Uh, that this equation, like, are you building chatbots because of chatbots are cool? Or are, is the chatbot ask, actually bringing some value that no other technology or app or website wouldn't bring? And that's why, like, a pizza ordering bot, like I know, like I, I heard the copy bit about this quite nice, but still, like, is that the best use case for chatbots? Uh, so you should really just be solving problems and solving problems in a way that a chat is the best interface to do that, and an automated chat, and then it kind of gets easier. Then you can focus on the more smaller things, smaller things like. Uh, what are people asking and so on, but you, you should always start with, is the chatbot actually bringing value? Uh, and 
what I consider like really good is well, we work with customer service, so we see that as a good opportunity for chatbots because let's say in customer service operations, there's like 50 humans in these small cubicles answering the same questions every day about opening times and so on. So I don't see that that's really the future of humanity. So I think that bots can bring a lot of value to that equation because then we won't, wouldn't remove the humans, we would just move their work in this. For example, they would be they would selling the products in the chat or assisting with more advanced stuff instead of just writing the same things over and over. And kind of is the builder build chatbot is that I, I like uh, Slack chatbots are actually quite good, some of them. Uh, and I believe that they bring value and there's a lot of them already. So I know a lot of like you can use those to do scrum meetings and so on. They're actually quite nice. So it's not completely hopeless. And then one big thing is always is the hype. So all of the big companies went in with the chatbots and uh, you have the Watson that won Jeopardy uh, and Watson cures cancer and answers your questions and is a lawyer. And then kind of you build up these expectations and then the other ones come that, hey, let's build a chatbot and people expect that this will be kind of the next big thing this alien thing that comes to our organization and helps every, everybody with everything. And then you build it with, even though it might be really good, but you will never meet the expectations and then you will fail basically. So what we do with most customers, we kind of like try to lower the expectations. I know there are a lot of good customers that already know what's the status quo, but we basically just like lower the expectations, narrow the scope and say that there's an investment for the future and that's the best way to, move forward, but it's really hard uh, when, kind of, let's say, your company is selling chatbots, it's uh, really hard not to over-promise and under-deliver because the expectation is already really high when customers come in. And when, even though you say then that this is chat, chatbot for, let's say, booking a flight, and it's like uh, that's the only thing it does, and then you deploy it, and people ask, hey, what should I, what should I do next weekend? And it will say, sorry, I didn't understand. Oh, this is a bad bot. But it's kind of funny. Funny, but like managing expectations is also a really big thing in chatbots. Uh, uh, yeah, basically. Oh. So I think that was my rant about what are kind of the worst, <laughs> like what are the bad things about chat or hard things about chatbots i would like to have a few slides on maybe what's the future or what ai might bring to the conversational interfaces uh, and this kind of related to apis also is that there's a lot of research going on with question and answering systems so instead of us tailoring the answers or building templated answers we could actually just give a lot of for example a book the machine uh, and then ask questions about the book and the machine will do deductions and answer you uh, hopefully correctly and maybe in the future you could have APIs and the machine could actually you could ask stuff and it could kind of do deductions of the, uh, from the API or the data from the API and give you answers and these are uh, I'm not seeing these like this won't be the year 2017 but maybe uh, somewhere in the future, like these really actually working expert systems, not the ones they had in the 90s. And this is one like uh, uh, these deep learning models can actually get right. There's this Facebook Bobby, Bobby data set that had, had, has these kind of challenges. And it's kind of a bit of scary also, like how well they can actually deduct stuff I had to think of with. But the answer is Charlie in this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah good. Uh, and this was kind of our experience in uh, experiment in generative bots. So we built this Twitter bot that uh, it kind of it was a recurrent neural network that learned or read Kalevala and uh, learned the structure and how to write Kalevala. And then we asked it to write more. Uh, and it generated these poems by itself. And this is completely a copy paste, so this is really unedited. And what was really interesting is that it actually learned uh, 
in Finnish it's uh, Kanevala runomitta, meaning that there's eight syllables in each line. So if you start counting, it actually has eight syllables in each line, and then the basically the line breaks. So it's really interesting that you could actually learn this. Uh, structures of written text and Kalevala is not even that big if you think about it data-wise data I think it was 250,000 words or something like that uh, but uh, why we chose Kalevala was because you can't really understand it's the original version so even though this is semantically it doesn't make any sense it kind of uh, it's okay because Kalevala is really hard to understand anyway <laughs> and this is uh, what uh, Stanford uh, postdoc did with Trump. So basically the same thing, but all of the tweets of Trump. Uh, and uh, you should really follow deep Trump. It's actually really good. And uh, it starts to get really well, uh, good with kind of also with semantics. And uh, yeah, uh, and I don't know, maybe it's the mirror to the mind of Trump, but it's really interesting. And, I, like how this relates to chatbot is that I don't see a future where people build these chatbots and they kind of manually write the answers. Maybe you have to do it now, but in 10 years, hopefully you're not doing it. You're actually, these networks are generating, you're teaching them to answer in a different way. Uh, and then you just feed in the important data to the, to the chatbots and they will kind of do the deductions for you. And that's the, that's the future I'm, I'm hoping for. Uh, just to, as a summarize, they are hard because we don't understand what are their strengths, where you should use chatbots and where you shouldn't use. And when you use something somewhere that you shouldn't be using, it's always bad. And, but, the, but that's with everything. Uh, also, we don't really know what people are asking from the bots uh, because people are really unpredictable. And it might be even that you communicated it wrong. People didn't understand what it is. And that's the third point is that people don't know what they should ask or what they can do. You have a chatbot, you say, hello, and then it says hello, and then like, what, what are you doing? Why are you here? What should I do? So it's really kind of uh, hard as a consumer to use chatbots if there isn't uh, guidance from the bot. Or if you have a Slack bot, usually they have this really good uh, intros on what you can do. Uh, but still, there's a lot of improvement they should, they should do. The AI is still not there. Uh, to have these actually conversational uh, kind of uh, use cases. We have a few few demos or use cases with kind of this, you just FAQ style, you bring the correct answers and then these really conversational versions. And the good and bad thing is that with the uh, FAQ style, you, the good thing is that you get the answers you're looking for, but it's really limited. If you ask something else, it will say that I cannot understand all, I redirect it to a human. Then you have a really conversational ver version where the AI generates the answer or there's a huge amount of data behind it, but it's really hard to predict what the machine is actually answering. And then when you bring those to enterprise world, that doesn't really work. Uh, but the AI is going there. I think uh, even though natural language is really hard problem, I think we are moving uh, really fast. And hopefully in the future we can get as close with accuracy as the speech recognition. Uh, some say that uh, natural language is AI complete problem. So to understand language, you need to understand life itself. You need to understand what is love and uh, what is hate to be able to talk with humans. And it might be true. Uh, but still, I don't think you need to build general AI to actually have these really good uh, chatbots. And then the hype is too strong. So when you can defend the hype, uh, you can actually uh, provide value to customers uh, and just like try to avoid the mistakes of the past. With these, I know there's been like this is the fourth AI boom, and all three were a bust. But I hope, hopefully. Here we can be really practical with these chatbots and build, build good use cases of them, which is why I think uh, there is future for these bots. We need to just be careful of where we use them. And I'm happy to have a conversation with you guys, so please ask questions about experiences or anything, and I'll answer them. the first one. I will be thinking about uh, 
finding new ways of of to this world of chat chatbots. It's completely new. Nothing nothing solid chatbot to learn human languages. So doing small talk. Or the conversation. Yeah. Well like what you can do is you can use these generative networks. Uh, let's say you can take well for in English you can take like all posts of Reddit, which is like billions, and train the machine to have a conversation. And when you ask something, you will just predict what's the most probable answer. Uh, uh, but then you have zero control, or basically the answers are what the data set is, and it's kind of it's, it's dangerous, so to speak. Uh, be too generic. Right? That would be like way too generic. Yeah, yeah. One is that you could actually have this uh, kind of auto-generated templates, which you fill in with uh, data, and that's something we are kind of looking into. So you, you do something manually, but the rest is generated. Uh, and then there are, I know there are some other kind of um, data sets that you can use to train some sort of a, uh, generative stuff, but still use kind of the static answers combined. But it's really hard because like now we have kind of the opposite sides of things. So how to go with the middle? I think we need to kind of think completely something new, but haven't really <laughs> don't have the answer to that yet. And perhaps people should learn some some new ways of communicating instead of trying to do machines who try to yeah that's copy true. people um, languages. Yeah, yeah. Let's try to learn binary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the correct answer. And the problem is that humans are really hard to change, so I think it's easier for machines to change. Actually, I think it's already For very on your behalf, like we, we are not usually very considerate when we are talking to bots. We feel like you know whatever I'm going to ask a bot, it it is going to answer. It is supposed to answer. So, so whatever the domain is, I, I think we should be a bit considerate and we should like lower our expectations when we are communicating with bots. Obviously, someone who has a technical background is ha has this like preconceived notion that okay, so this is not as intelligent as people might think that it is. But for like general people, they're like okay, you know, let's bust this yeah. chatbot. I don't really even really like the word chatbot because it's so generic, like. Because let's say we use this in customer service automation, so we're kind of, it's the front line. It, it gives the uh, quick answers to kind of I go to a bank and I ask about an opening time or whatever. I just want the answer, nothing else. I don't have much to have a conversation. I just want to ask because it's so complicated. I just want to ask. When I get the answer, I'm happy. That's it. A good bot. Uh, then I have a Slack bot and I know what to do with it. Let's say I can interact with an API. I know what to kind of ask. I know what kind of API there is. I can ask, give me this and this from last year and so on so on. And it works. But then like when you think of chatbots as kind of just chatbots, then people start having conversations and then like yeah, that's um, yeah. So I mean, there is this way that uh, when uh, we were studying it, it works that they say that whenever you are designing for a chatbot, maybe you just mention it on its own like when it's interacting with a user that i am a silly chatbot i i can answer in a very limited uh limited how to say that uh, like yeah so it's like a disclaimer so that even if you are not a tech person just a normal user like a maybe a grandma is coming to us that when the shop is going to open you can just they can just like understand that okay it's just a Chatbot or yeah, just and, and it's about managing the expectations. Yeah. And like, if you think about that, people should learn how to speak to bots. Like, well, what about when I use the terminal? I basically interact with the bot. I give commands, and it does what I want to do. Uh, kind of that's the extreme example of that. So I have to know uh, what's the pseudo ch blah 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 blah. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of also having conversations with machines, but then it's not really natural language. So, uh, but yeah, but it's, it's not chatbots are not really black and uh, white. But it's, it's a bot that knows everything, or a bot doesn't know anything. Do you have, do you have any favorite 
bots uh, kind of bots you use kind of regularly and you think they are in any way? Uh, I don't. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I do actually. A few, I use a few messenger bots. Uh, I want use this. There was this bot from I don't know which university it was, but it's basically this. Uh, it's not meditation bot, but it's basically it just checks in every day and asks how you're doing, what are you feeling, and it's kind of this journal journaling bot. And I actually really like that because it's kind of reminds me to kind of do some reflecting. And there was some research that they actually boost mental health and so on. That's something that's actually really good. I, I tried it and kind of sort of got hooked. Uh, I use a few bots as RSS feeds. So I get news from the RSS feeds I want uh, because I don't want to have an RSS reader. I don't know how to uh, download them. So I just want a few RSS feeds to my Facebook Messenger, and that's it. And then on Slack, you have this. I don't know what's the name of it, but this uh, you have this kind of this Pomodoro bots basically. So and then uh, this daily meetup. So it asks what what did you do today? Because we as a company, we each day we write what we what we did and what we going to do. So we use those. Uh, yeah, but again, they are really specific to this specific thing. Uh, personally, I haven't tried the Akoti pizza bot. Yeah. <laughs> Is a smooth bot, and uh, that somehow got, I got irritated because even that I split it off, it still gave me the offers. Yeah, so, yeah. so I removed it after a couple of days. And that's really like hard because we had one experiment with the client that we built this uh, trade show bot, and people had a conversation. And after the trade show, we sent a push message. On, we never did that before. Send a push message. How, how did it go? And they were like, like shut the like go, like why are you messing? It's really personal. You we kind of invade their privacy because it's their messenger, and now they're getting these push messages that they don't want to get. And it's not like spam email. It's really really personal. So it's really uh, you you can really uh, destroy their relationships quite easily with those bots. How do you, how do you make any, any charges in, in authentication? Uh, well, well, not a lot of challenges in a way that couldn't be tackled. Like uh, you can do authentication inside the kind of the chat or deploy or go and log in and come back and get the context. We usually we build we don't build the chat software. We usually build the plugins to other software. Uh, so they already might have the contextual information available through APIs to us. So we haven't had a lot of problems, but the use cases have been really simple. How do you see the business side of that going? Is it going to be custom or particular uses in chat? Or are there going to be services so that, that, that yeah, so, uh, well, I have a long answer. So one is that uh, we have the, the whole architecture we have is really big. So we do a lot of stuff uh, with language. For example, we have our own uh, lemmatizer, meaning that we take the lemma of a word, which is kind of the base form of a word. And that's really important in Finnish because, like, for the word kalpa, you have 2,000 different inflections, which means that machine sees 2,000 different words. So if you can get those to one, the dictionary is really uh, small. And that's something we actually are considering maybe releasing as an API uh, because that's something that's really hard. <laughs> uh, and since we've been a lot, done a lot of work with it, then why not? Uh, for example, uh, we did the integration to SAP. We actually help them open their APIs to build the bot integrations. Uh, and we try to build everything with them in a way that it's generic as possible because people are already using uh, the same systems in the back end with, uh, with CRM or whatever. So we can actually build this kind of, at least the integration is generic. But then when we have a customer, there is, at least at this point, there is some custom work 
to be done as how they what use cases for example they if they want to track something or you can ask about your package or whatever there's some custom work but we as a company try to build uh, this kind of uh, be as generic as possible because we don't want kind of training this uh, and this one language model in a way that the intents we build are generic. So let's say I have an intent like pets, pets opening time or pets location. Uh, we use those with every customer. So when somebody, or some customer gives us more data, it kind of, kind of populates the whole knowledge. Uh, so at, at some point, and then the, they are per domain. So let's say airlines, telcos, and so on. So at some point we could just have these modules that, hey, there's an airline, so add these and these and these, uh, and then these specific use cases, and then a few kind of more custom use cases, and you're good to go. Because uh, that's really hard with deep learning, but you need a lot of data. And if you have to start from the beginning with everything,